All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next in our Women in Business keynote series. I'm thrilled to see all of you. Welcome to the extended select group family. I know Jennifer's invited a number of family and friends of hers uh, to join with us. And I told Jennifer in the past, we've had some um, Women in Business keynote speakers that have been sharing their story and it's been really helpful for them to share it with some of their friends and family members that may not know all of their story. So um, we're excited to, to have a number of them with us today. Uh, for us internally, uh, welcome to the next in our keynote series. You guys know all too well that these are meant to be interactive. We would love to have your engagement as we go through the session. Please utilize the chat feature as much as you would like. Um, Missy and I will be monitoring that for any comments or questions that may pop up. Uh, I would definitely encourage you guys to also share your video. Um, I know we're all still working from home and Jennifer would love to see all of your smiling faces as well. And um, there will be a Q&A at the end. So I would encourage you to be sure that you're jotting down some questions as we go throughout the session. Um, but of course, if you have any during the session, just pop those in the chat and I can um, interject Jennifer accordingly. Jennifer was introduced to the select group through Lydia Schimmelfenig, who all of you know um, through our Women in Business program. Uh, Jennifer and Lydia were good friends, um, or are good friends um, in Southern California. And Jennifer recently in the last couple of years has relocated to Dallas, Texas. So um, I know Lydia and Jennifer miss each other dearly. And I think I just saw Lydia pop on the call as well. So welcome Lydia. Um, with all of that said, Jennifer's got an incredible session for us um, and has got a lot to share. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Um, this meeting, as you saw, it is being recorded. So there is my disclaimer for you guys. Um, and we will be sure to share the recording with you after the session. So Jennifer, stage is all yours. All right. <clears throat> thank you. So thank you, Lee Wallace and Missy and, and Lydia for inviting, really inviting me to be here with you today. So um, I wanted to meet with, with all of you and really share my journey kind of over the last 20 years, but don't worry, I'll, I'll be brief uh, because, and the reason why I want to share is because it wasn't always exactly how I planned, but it turned out, it turned out pretty great. So I would say that each season really had a purpose and, and why we call it the jungle gym. Um, so I hope that you find, you know, Maybe it's pieces of the story that might resonate with you um, or resonate with something that you may be struggling with, or maybe in the future you reflect on some of this conversation um, as a new opportunity comes your way. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think we're all just trying to find ways to enjoy life and, and leave a positive, positive imprint on the world while we're here. Uh, you can start at the first slide. So, so I'll start by sharing a little bit about my life and kind of what I've been up to. Um, as Lee Wallace said, so I'm a new Texan. Uh, we've been here about 10 months uh, in Dallas uh, from Southern California. And I do, I do love it here. Um, miss a little bit of the weather in, in California, but it's a little bit more humid here uh, in, in Texas at times. But my positive spin is, you know, the humidity does do wonders for your skin. So there's always an opportunity to, to spin something there. Uh, so I've been married to my husband, Brian, uh, for about 16 years, and he's been extremely supportive in, in all of my, my career jumping around. <laughs> and we have three kids. So uh, my oldest, Taylor, is 24. Uh, Derek is 21. And Brett, the goofy one of us all, he's 11. Um, you know, life isn't always perfect, but, but we do have a lot of fun together. And then, so my pride and joy is my puppy Willow. She is very cuddly, um, very cute. Uh, so I had to put her on the screen as well. Uh, so I have an undergraduate degree in accounting and an emphasis in finance and real estate from University of San Diego. Um, and I have a few months left at Villanova and then I'll be done with my MBA. So I've been with Wells Fargo for about 13 years now. Um, and I'd say I probably have had at least 13 different jobs there. Uh, so right now I'm leading um, the, the delivery of our regulatory commitments uh, focused on our customer issues. 
so this is a, a pretty intense time <laughs> and, and, and job that we're focused on right now. But, but prior to what I've been doing with the regulatory work is uh, spent some time in finance, uh, spent some time in HR, uh, ran some strategy and customer experience team. So I just, I really never had a dull moment with um, being at Wells Fargo. So before I came to Wells Fargo, I worked in the real estate development industry. And before that, I was a, a CPA uh, focused on audit and, and consulting. So you'll see, I, I started with an accounting degree and now I work with a whole bunch of lawyers and regulators and I do nothing with accounting anymore. So I just think it's just been a really interesting, interesting ride, but I feel like I've grown at, um, at every intersection point. So if you go to the, the next slide, a couple of things I wanted to, to share with you all today and talk about. So I would say one of my, my biggest learnings um, and reflection points ha has been my career decisions. So, so I chose a little bit of a different path than most. So I'm not saying my path is right. Um, for me, it just wasn't a straight line in my career. So for me, I enjoy you know, learning different things. I enjoy change, um, new things. So I'll walk through some of these bullet points on the left, and then I'll explain kind of the, the confusing squiggly on the right and why I included that visual. So uh, the first thing I would call out is, is really think about what brings you joy. So it doesn't mean that every minute of your job, you're smiling through the day. Um, I survived a three-hour meeting with like 100 lawyers, so I definitely was not smiling through that one. But um, if you think about it, but there's typically, there's portions of every job um, that are not maybe exactly exciting, but in general, really reflect on what, what portions of your job or prior jobs that like brought you joy. Like you actually smiled when you were doing that part of, of your work. Um, so for me, and I'll kind of go through these, and I'll just share maybe an example of, of what that means for me, and hopefully that's helpful. So for me, if you're familiar with Strength Finders, um, I'm a relator and I'm an achiever. So I really love working with people. I love connecting with people, but I also love to get stuff done. So through the years, I've reflected on that is what brings me joy. And I write it down and I remind myself all the time. <laughs> so the, the, the second bullet you know, to go through is I don't think you need to know what you want to do in your career. Great if you do awesome if you do. That just wasn't me. Um, I knew what I did not want to do. So, so for me, even though I had an accounting degree, after I got, I didn't really want to do accounting. I just didn't, when I went into public accounting, I didn't, you know, like the, the routine part of accounting. And I just never really saw myself being a controller or an accounting manager. It just wasn't for me, but I loved consulting. And even though I didn't like the accounting part, you know, I do enjoy a good spreadsheet. Um, as, as we all do, but uh, I just, I love the consulting piece. So I, I just threw every job or season, I really figured out, you know, yeah, I, I don't like to do that. And that's just as good as knowing what you want to do. Um, so the other, the third bullet point here is I have a list of jobs I would be happy at doing in 10 years from now. And it's not just one, it changes often. Um, but I reflect, uh, I try to do it in January. I do, um, you know, reflect on, on these goals and these lists and, and I revisit those and just ensure I'm on track to one of those, you know, jobs in 10 years down the road. Um, so leading into these next couple of bullets, I would say that it's really important to identify the skills that you've mastered and the skills that you still need to develop. Um, so as you're going through you know, a career move, it's, it's not always a new job. It could be a new project, um, it could be a stretch assignment, a volunteering opportunity. There's, there's just so many ways to accomplish this. Um, so what I've done is, I have a list of here are the skills that I've mastered. 
And um, here are the skills that I need to still develop. Because you can be very intentional in a job change in uh, volunteering for a stretch assignment, all those pieces. I made sure that I brought something to the table, um, but I also made sure that I learned a new skill that would really help me kind of align to my goals or, or brings me joy. And I know it's scary to take risks. Risks are very important to take, but be strategic about it. it it's hard to hear some people say, you know, take a risk. Um, don't be flippant or ignorant in the risks you take. Really balance um, how you take those risks. And, and I wanna explain the squiggly to the right and give a little bit of, of meat to that comment. You'll see in the top left, I was doing accounting in the consulting world. My next job, you'll see I kept doing accounting, but then I jumped into the real estate industry. So you'll see there's a commonality in every jump I do. Part of it, I have a master, I've mastered it and I bring something to the table, but the other part is new. So as you go through this squiggly, like that second one, I had accounting and finance in the real estate industry. Well, I wanted to get out of the real estate industry. So then I went to auto finance, which Wachovia is now Wells Fargo. Um, but I knew finance. So I brought finance to the banking industry. And then once I was in the auto industry, then I could jump around a lot. So you'll see I had a handful of jobs in the auto finance part of Wells Fargo. I did compensation in HR. I did strategy in digital. I did customer experience. And because I knew the auto industry and I knew the business, and so I brought that expertise to each one of these, but strategically I gained something different. And then my last two jobs that I finally made that jump where I had enough functional skill set um, being in the auto industry that now I was able to jump and do customer experience for what we call enterprise or Wells Fargo as a whole. Um, and then now being able to, as I've had the experience at Wells Fargo as a whole, now I can jump into something new with um, some of our regulatory interactions. Um, so I hope, I hope that made some sense. I have uh, one more kind of slide, Lee Wallace. I don't know if you want to pause here for some questions or if I should just go through this one, this last piece, um, slide three first. Yeah, we can pause here. Um, I guess, guys, thoughts, questions around how Jennifer has kind of gotten to where she is now. I know there are a lot of comments that she made around, um, you know, skills mastery and, and just wanting to, to take your career to the next level and, and just focusing in on, on those things. Does anyone have thoughts or questions um, for Jennifer at this point? Feel free to unmute your line. Great. Well, I can go on to the next slide. Yep. So this would be the other thing I would, I would share too. Another really key component of my career growth is um, identifying a business gap or a problem and then solve it. So I feel that there's this common misperception at times that doing your job well um, will take you to all, all, all different opportunities. And I think I would just say, in my experience, I think doing your job well is really table stakes. Um, it, it helps you keep your job. It's really important to do your job well, <laughs> just to clarify for the group. Um, but you really have to go above and beyond if you want to get noticed, get those opportunities. So this, this next one, I have to explain a little bit. Um, you know, if and when you can, volunteer and sign up for projects that are class worthy. So, so what this means is that like when you're done with the project, it's not like nobody's gonna know it was done, you know, nobody's paying attention to it. It's like people will clap that you solved this problem. It is a big enough problem, it is important to enough people and your leadership and aligning with your strategy that um, it, was, it was really a good opportunity to jump in and fix. So it means if it's an issue today, it continually comes up, nobody can fix it or wants to figure it out. Um, that could be a really good opportunity if, you, if you're able to, you know, if you're able to volunteer 
um, for this or, or um, work with your leader on that piece. Um, I would say is, is any effort you're on, you know, really make sure you're aligned to your, your leader's needs and aligned to your company's goals. Um, there's this, this other bullet is knowing when it's time to move on or your effort isn't important anymore. And this is a painful one. I'll give an example as, as one time. So I spent it's probably six months, long days, long weekends, hours, uh, leading a team where we were going to, we were migrating to an entirely new servicing platform uh, to give some perspective. So six months of work. Uh, we had at the time over 4 million customers in this business that I was a part of, big project. And at the end of the day, it just wasn't the right time. Our efforts needed to be focused elsewhere. Our strategic goals switched and it was really hard, but you know, we, I had to bring up and we had to talk about, is it time to pause this? Um, it's important to not hold on to that work. I could have held on to it and said, I've done six months. It's really big. I just want to finish it. Um, but I pivoted quickly. It was the right decision. And I don't view those six months as wasted. Um, it, it really made me grow. So I think it's just take a step back and really be strategic with all these items that you're involved in. And also, if you feel like it isn't important anymore, talk, talk to your leader about that. Um, and don't hold on to it. Even if it's spent days and months working on things, don't hold on to that. Um, you know, one last one last item. I know I've thrown a lot out here and we'll, we'll pause and have some discussion too. But um, one word I've heard a lot through through my career is because I've jumped around a lot of a lot of different places. So some may say, "Well, you've been really lucky, right? You know, this opportunity popped up. I, I was lucky." Um, I so I go off the thing to saying that the definition of good luck um, it's being ready when the opportunity presents itself. So if someone says you've just been really lucky, you know, just remember that you were ready when the opportunity came up and, and you did the work to be considered for that opportunity. And I think that's really important. Uh, so Lee Wallace, that is, you know, some of my big kind of takeaways. I, I know that we can just have more of an open dialogue if there's any questions or anything else anyone wants me to jump into a little bit further. Yeah, I guess a, a follow-up question or thought I had just around, you know, this particular slide is, if you identify, and, and perhaps this was the case for you, if you identify that there's a business gap or problem, whatever you want to call it, um, in an area that's not in your scope, right? So say, for example, you're in finance and you recognize that there's a business gap in marketing, in sales, in HR, whatever it might be. <clears throat> Any thoughts or advice on like, what's the appropriate way to approach that, right? Without saying, hey, here, I work in the finance world, yeah. but I see that y'all have an opportunity. How can I help you fix it, right? Without kind of coming across as, you know, it, that's totally outside of your kind of vertical. Any thoughts there? It happens a lot, especially in big companies. A lot of people like to pontificate or um, admire the problem, we say. <laughs> so um, things that I have done that have, have worked well is um, I reflect on how I can help. So instead of pointing out what's not working in other people's backyards, I will come to them and say, I've noticed this is the problem. Um, here's how I can help you. And, and I think that uh, people are more receptive to hearing the problem. You're also coming with a solution. And we're not just sitting and all talking about the problem and admiring it, but nobody's actually doing something. So not only am I gonna identify what the issue is, but I will find out how I can help the person. I may not be able to run the whole thing. I may be able to help with a portion. Sometimes it's an introduction to someone else. Sometimes it's a, hey, I know the system well, can I help you with, with requirements, brainstorming? There, there's always some way you can help um, with identification of that business gap. Uh, and it may not be that you're running the whole effort, but I would really try to reflect on what skill set experience can you bring to the person who owns that problem and help them. 
but, but yeah, de- admiring the problem is um, very common. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we joke, we joke, we, um, you know, say like someone take the wheel, <laughs> right. You know, at the end of the day. So I figure out, you know, what, what I can, I can do to help them. And, um, at the end of the day too, I'm really genuine about it. Uh, and I think that helps. So when I come up to someone, I say, I know this isn't my project, but here's what I can do. And they really feel like I'm trying to help them. Not that I'm trying to go around them or anything like that. So I think just be really, um, genuine in all interactions too. Awesome. What other um, questions from the field do we have? I know there's about 30 of you on the call, so I'm sure that there's some thoughts and and, um, opinions here. Hey, Jennifer, I'll jump in here. Um, Yeah, thanks so much. I think this slide here resonates with me a lot. So I think a question I have, it's kind of a follow-up of Lee Wallace's question is just, you know, when you see those moments and, uh, you know, kind of to Lee Wallace's point, you're not, it's not in your scope. Um, do you ever feel as though, do you feel pressure, maybe intrinsic pressure to learn as much as you can, as quick as you can, so that you can, you know, speak the language, talk the talk. And um, if so, I'm just curious how, how you approach that, how you get over that. Uh, but maybe it's not a factor to you either. So just kind of curious. Yeah, you know, Eric, I run into this a lot more being in um, an enterprise role. So in Wells Fargo, you know, the enterprise role that I have, it's um, I get involved in a lot of different businesses across Wells Fargo. So more often than not, I do not have the expert knowledge because the scope is too broad. Um And I, it just, it's impossible. There's some pieces that I know more about, but in general, there's no way I know about commercial banking and wealth management and branches and all that stuff. So I run into this often. Um, And at first, when I first came into some of these enterprise roles, I felt that uh, I felt uncomfortable that I didn't know all the details, Uh, but, you know, I embraced it. And I tried a couple of times and said, I'm just going to be a little vulnerable here. And I would reach out. I I usually wouldn't do it in a big forum. (laughs) I would be more vulnerable in a smaller setting, but I would reach out to that person because at the end of the day, we're all people. And I would just say, look, I don't have all the facts. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm still learning your business line. But here is what I, what I see. Um, and, and here would be some thoughts that I would have, but my biggest takeaway there is like, uh, embrace that you're not the expert on everything. And you don't have to pretend that you are. I don't, because I find when people pretend that they're the expert, um, you usually just kind of embarrass yourself (laughs) because you don't don't know the details, right? So just call it and just say, hey, I know I'm not the expert, but um, here's what I've seen. Here's maybe how I can help. Awesome. Thank you. And be vulnerable. It's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jennifer. Um, I was curious, kind of going back to some of your hops between coming through and accounting to finance and all the different kind of journey that you made, you were saying part of the idea is you want to be a master of some of the things, but not all of the things going into a new role, um, because obviously it's a little boring if you know everything about it already, but I guess coming out of the previous role, is there a point where you're thinking like, this is how I know that I've kind of mastered the previous stuff. I obviously for different skills, it's going to be a different level, but I'm just curious if like at that point where you're ready to move on into the next step, Mm -hmm. is there a way that you know that this is the time for that to happen? Or I know I have enough knowledge to do that. And I think that's a great question, Natalie. So, um, and you're probably not going to like my answer because the time, you know, when it's time to move on is when your job is easier. When you have all the answers, when everyone comes to you, and you just know all the answers and you, you know, you are the person to go to. And, and the reason why I think that's a really hard answer is that that feels good to be that master, right? It feels good to be the person that everyone wants in that meeting and that everyone, oh, well, we can't move forward. We have to call Jennifer because she knows this like the back of her hand. That's the time when it's time to find something different because you've mastered it. Um, and that's the hardest time to walk away though. And when I say find something different to clarify 
I don't mean, it doesn't always mean find a new job. It may mean like volunteer for a stretch assignment or reach out to a partner group and say, can I just learn a little bit more about what you're doing? There's a lot of different ways. And I'm sure, you know, the leaders in your organization will help help direct that way. So it doesn't always have to be a job change, but when you're starting to feel really comfortable and when you are the person that they call on for everything, that's a good trigger to know, like, I think it's time that I need to, you know, learn something else too. The hardest time though, because <laughs> it's nice to, to be that person, right? It's nice to say, oh, we got to include Natalie and in everything because she, she's an expert on this piece, but that's what I would say is the trigger. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in. Hi, Jen. Hi. <laughs> um, so I want to acknowledge what, I don't know that, um, I don't know how much people picked up on this, but Jen has had a tremendous amount of success in her career and to have a title like that and at an organization that's not a small organization is a testament to a lot of qualities that I think you all can see in Jennifer. And one of the things, Jen, I'd love for you to share your thoughts on with the group is building networks. And Wells Fargo is a huge enterprise, obviously a larger organization than the select group, but nonetheless, something that we've talked about in the women in business program and is relevant to anybody in their career. How do you, how have you successfully built networks such that I'm pretty sure you shared with me that you were tasked by the CEO directly um, to work on this current regulatory situation that you're working on. Um, so you've had, you've done something right there. Share with us what you've done to build your network. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it is very important in a company that's very large, but I would say it's just important in, in every, everyone's role because um, a network is, can help you grow. Um, there, you know, Lydia's one in my network and not only a good friend, but there's a lot of times where I just need to bounce ideas off of people. So there's nothing wrong with networking groups. So there's nothing wrong with any of that type of pieces. But what I have found through the years um, is that there, there's two things that people really kind of remember in a professional environment as you go on to different jobs. If you did that clapworthy project, right? Something that sticks out is like, oh, she fixed that problem. Or, oh, she launched that system. Or, oh, she transitioned that website. Whatever the case may be. Yes, those are always good not she did her job really well, right? Like those, those rememberable projects are great to have as you work with more and more people. But I also think too, is the biggest thing with the network building is everyone you work with um, could be your boss one day, uh, could work for your team down the road, could uh, go around a different company and, and connect with you one day. So how I try to focus is that everyone remembers how you made them feel, right? At the end of the day, we all have uh, I've done, like I said, I think I've done like 13 different jobs. I probably had 20 different bosses. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, everyone remembers how you partnered with them, how you listened to their ideas and how you made them feel going through that. And I think that combined with your exposure of working on different things um, is really how you build your strong network. For me too, building a strong network is, um, I was a, a board chair for the last uh, four years for a nonprofit. Before that, I was finance chair. And um, volunteering, finding your passion that you, that you want to do. The networking is not only in your current role, in your current company. Um, find ways to volunteer and find others that have similar passion. But again, the biggest thing is everyone I interact with, whether they're the most senior level, whether they're, uh, you know, frontline uh, employee who's answering phones and I'm doing a side-by-side, -side, right, learning more about something. My goal is to treat everyone the exact same, and I'm really genuine with my interactions. You get me all the time. You don't get a different person because I'm talking to, you know, the CEO or I'm talking to someone who's answering the phones. It's just, it's just me. So I think that is really important in, in network building. Thanks, Jen. 
Hey, Jennifer, uh, Fletcher here. Uh, th thanks again. This has been wonderful. I'm really glad to be a part of this and just get to enjoy the experience. We just certainly appreciate your time. Um, one of the most powerful things I think I heard you say is uh, for me, just jumping out with a lot of my team members and knowing that like, you know, that to not know the answer is okay, to fake it is the worst thing and just accepting that who you are and being humble and you know genuine as people. I think you mentioned people wanna help people. That's what we're inspired to do as humans. Um, mm -hmm. I think ego gets in the way there. I think it's time to come in and if I don't already know the answer, I better act it and that way no one will doubt my capability or confidence. And I think that's a struggle we have in developing people and holistically. I'd be curious in asking just, uh, has I learned more falling on my face than I ever have succeeding? Uh, maybe could you share one of your biggest failures that you came away with the big, like the big aha from? Yeah. Oh, well, there, there's a lot. Um, it, I think that there's a lot of pressure to know everything. Um, there's a lot of pressure to anticipate any question that could possibly be asked. Uh, the worst place to ever fake it <laughs> or pretend you do something um, is especially in, in some of my finance times where I got a number wrong because I didn't validate and it ended up the number that I provided, um, at the time I was, uh, so as an example, really clear example, I was leading, um, uh, employee incentives for uh, one of our consumer lending businesses. And I, I guessed at a certain number, I thought I was right, but I didn't say like, I need to validate and come back. And because I threw out a certain number, it was like, we had to back into that number for the next six months <laughs> and we had to like figure it out. And it was like, gosh, if I could go back and do anything, I would have rewound and just say, um, I'm pretty sure this is the number I'm going to go back and validate and I'll let everyone know. So that was one of my biggest, because I was um, then committed to that number. So then for the next six months, uh, the leader I was working with said, well, you told me it was 20. And so you now have to figure out to make it 20. Some, something like that. Uh, so numbers are the one thing that I never pretend to have have perfect answer on. Um, the the other examples too is when we get into a lot of um, specifics around risk or anything legal or in any any specific item too. Um, I always say, let me go back and read that 200 page document again. And let me just double check. <laughs> Here's my stance, but, but I go back. So I do a lot of my takeaway is to um, come back to the group. So I just, I've just been burned a few times in some very key instances where it's very important. And I have no problem saying, I don't know the answer, but I will get right back to you. And then when I hang up on that call, hang up on that meeting, I get back to them within no later than three hours because I want them to know that it, I'm not just blowing that off yeah. and just saying that because I don't want to answer your question. I just want to really make sure that I'm providing the accurate information and I need some time to validate that. But I always, my three hours is, is kind of my limit if I do do any of that takeaway. Um, and if I can't figure it out in three hours, I'll, I'll let you know a time frame specifically when I can get back. Yeah, I love that. I, I just think it's so powerful as it's resonated. I'm not sure how many years ago, but in my past life, I managed restaurants. And the interesting is the corporate would come in and say, what's the recipe? People would always respond with the first thing that jumped out versus, great, let me look in the recipe book and give that to you. Both answers, you know, you jump out and get it wrong, they score you wrong. Or you say, I got it right here. You know where to find the answer. And sometimes that's just as powerful as me and how to connect the dots versus always having it in your pocket and then letting ego take advantage. So I appreciate that. Uh, context and just that insight I believe everybody could just learn and that it's okay and you know the most powerful thing we can do is the next time that comes up have a better stance on it from our learnings from this time so I really appreciate that and just you know hope holistically everyone can accept that we're all creatures of uh, learning and, and, and development and, and, and it's okay to let someone know but I loved your uh, as mentioned with Lydia I loved your integrity saying if I can't get to you within the time I said it, we'll all make sure I tell you in advance that I'm going to get to you and that I didn't forget you. And I think that's just as powerful. So, you know, we, oh no, I said 30 minutes. Well, I'll just dodge and hope that they don't make eye contact versus own it. And people remember that and then continue to build that trust and respect. So very awesome and appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Fletcher. And the, the one thing too I would add to that is that people who have worked with me a lot, they know I'm not, you know, blowing it off. 
Like I, and, and you get more grace that way. And they're more acceptance of you saying, no, I don't have the answer because they know in my integrity, I'm going to, I'm going to find out though. And I'm going to get back to them. I'm not just trying to, trying to blow them off. So I think over time, as you're building, you know, your brand and how you want people to think about you, like that is important. People recognize, people remember those who circle back and people remember those who don't. So it's important. Yeah. Great That's question. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I maybe got one more, and if you don't mind, it makes me think. I'm very uh, fortunate in my stance to where I have a great support system, and I saw the balance that you have with that beautiful family, the dog, and, and then such a, a great career. Uh, Work-life balance, is that a negative word, nasty to you, or do you believe in it? Like, I guess just uh, what are your thoughts there. You know, work-life balance is a very interesting um, conversation and, and, and dialogue. Uh, because I, I want to think that you can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. And, and, and that's okay. Uh, you know, I think it's a unique challenge for, for women, especially because, um, whether you're, you know, you're a mom, whether you're a mom to fur babies, whether you have like a, a, a really exciting, you know, um, hobby outside of work, you know, but, but being able to balance those pieces, how the only way how I've been able to do it is um, I have an amazing support system with my husband, my family, everyone being able to help. It truly takes a village to do, to do anything. Um, but a decision I made a, a while ago, and I really stick to, um, and I'm able to do this because I've been where I'm at for a while and I've built that, you know, um, people know that I'm going to get the job done and they've worked with me is that, um, life is work and work is life. And I enter and I intertwine them. So yeah, there's some days where I'm gone for a couple hours in the middle of the day because I'm doing something with my son or we're, you know, going out here. Or I had to drop them off at camp. Um, I'll still get my stuff done, but, um, I just, uh, made it work. And a lot of times, uh, most leaders are human too and they get it a lot of the times what i've noticed is it's all self-inflicted i think we put a lot more pressure on ourselves that you know i can't be gone for two hours in the middle of the day you know uh but who's really telling you that right <laughs> and i think it's just a good reminder because um and i still my husband still reminds me sometimes he's like you can take an hour lunch and go get lunch with me it's like you're right. I can. Why did I think that I couldn't? Because most of the time it's just us. It's not our leaders that are putting that undue pressure on us. It's mostly us. We're all adults and we can get our job done. And, um, but it's, it's still, it's something that I still have to work on and remind myself a lot. Um, but I've had to integrate work and life and life and work. So they're not separate for me. Yeah, that's Great again, and thank you. I've had the opportunity and been fortunate <clears throat> to where two of my leaders are our mothers and they're balancing that. And I hear that a lot of like either or instead of and. And the reality is you can't do them both at the same time, but you can be great at both of them. You just have to make sure prioritization and, and, and a calendar, calendar effective management pieces are all there. So I, I love your perspective. And when I saw that picture, it just resonated because I, I have some of those conversations and, you know, I'm I was fortunate. I grew up with a single mother that battled it all and handled it all and made it look easy. And I took it to, uh, for granted, but I see the challenges and adversities face. And I think there's this identity crisis of I have to pick one versus now you can pick them both, but you just have to accept you can't do them at the same exact time and making the, you know, the priority yeah. scheduling effective. Well, and, and another to go on that a little bit further, um, before I was in the job I'm in right now, I was on, on the auto side and I was doing a lot of the customer experience strategy work. Our auto business had huge uh, contact centers throughout the country, so four or five sites. And I would have to go to a lot of them, right, often. So I was on the road probably twice a month. And it was hard with the age my son was at. You know, my, my husband had his own tax practice at the time and we were just trying to juggle life. Uh, and I was able to find an opportunity that I'm in now where it still met all my strategic career goals, but um, I don't really have to travel. But this is before COVID. <laughs> but even now, I wouldn't have to travel as much. So I was able to find a solution. Um, and I would say that I had to be pushed 
whether it was my husband, whether it was someone else to say like, find a solution. And when you get creative, you'll find a solution. You'll find a way to, to just make it work and what you need in that life. And I'm not saying I'll never travel. I like, I like going to different sites and I love it. I'm a relator, right? I love working with people. Um, but in this season of my life, with my son being 11, us we're building our house, you know, in Dallas, we're having all this fun time is I'm, I'm choosing uh, experience that requires me being home more and me being on the road, the road less. But I don't have to take a step back or stop my career. I can still keep it going. You just got to, you got to think about it a little bit more. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. Thanks, Fletch. Anyone else have, have a question? I've got one more, but I'm curious um, if any of our women in business participants, if you guys have anything that you wanted to ask Jen, Jennifer. So one of the things that I um, have been thinking about, you know, is um, this group, right? Women in business. We've got people who are currently going through the program that are on this call. We've got folks who um, have previously gone through the program. We've got folks who have never been a participant in the program and certainly lots of allies and folks who want to just learn about how to navigate the career jungle gym, right? What can we do to support one another as we all advance our careers? Um, I'm curious, just thinking about the, the topic of you know, women in business, women in leadership, um, have there been any obstacles that you felt that you faced during your career, Jennifer, because of being a female? Um, and if so, or if not, um, what advice would you give um, to anyone who might be facing an obstacle because of their uh, gender? Yeah, really good question. Um, so I am of the belief that one of the things we as women do incorrectly in business is we try to pretend to be men. So I'll just say like, you're, you know, you don't have to pretend to be a guy at the end of the day. I feel like we have this pressure. Like I have to prioritize, um, you know, I have to be less feminine or I have to be more aggressive or I have to be, you know, I have to have these, these qualities that some of our male colleagues have, um, to sit at the table with them. Uh, and I'll say, I've been in a lot of meetings where I'm the only woman, <laughs> especially when I was in the real estate development you know, industry. Is like, I was not only the only woman, I was the youngest by a good decade. Um, and I didn't try to, to be the same as um, my men coworkers because I really believe in diversity of perspective and thought. And I'm at that table for a reason because I'm not them and I don't think like them. And that is why I've been asked to be at that table. So my biggest suggestion is just, you don't have to pretend to be a man in the workplace. Um, at the end of the day, you're there because of your diverse perspectives, right? You're there because you just have different qualities than your male counterparts, and that's nothing you need to hide. I would just really embrace it and find a way how that adds value to your team, how it adds value to the project, the company as a whole, because it is needed. And we talk about how there's fewer women at the top. I think that gives us women an opportunity to show um, the value that we bring, regardless of your gender or what, of, of anything, right? Like, um, but, but I, I do find in so many um, colleagues I've worked with uh, it, throughout the years is, people feel like they need to act more manly in business. I just don't think you need to. It's not genuine. And I think people respect it when you're just, you're genuine and, and you can bring something unique to the table. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and then one other question that I had, you know, just going back to Lydia's question around networking and, you know, equally important in net networking is the role of mentorship, right? And seeking out mentors. <clears throat> um, any thoughts or advice on 
how you've sought out a mentor um, and maybe perhaps any mentorship mentorship relationships that worked or didn't work for you in the past? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my biggest um, thing I would say first is um, be clear on whether you need a mentor or an advocate, two very different things. So an advocate, if you're looking for someone to support you in your career, um, if a job opportunity comes up and you want them to write a letter of recommendation, you want them to connect you with people, that is a very important role that is needed. Um, it is not a mentor, right? So I have a lot of advocates. I have a lot of sponsors. Um, as it relates to networking, I have sponsors. My goal is to have sponsors in many, many places, <laughs> right? And, and you get a sponsor by doing a good job. And, and, and how they interact with you. Um, I have like very, I've had very few um, mentors because I'm very particular about what you wanna get from a mentor. So when you put the sponsor or the advocate aside, if you really want a mentor, it should be something that you're gonna learn and grow from them and they're not your boss. So a mentor, um, you know, when I was doing a lot of uh, nonprofit work, I had uh, a mentor who has a lot of experience in the nonprofit that I can gain an understanding or learning from them as it relates to nonprofit leadership. Um, when I was in finance and I knew I wanted to make the switch over to be more in the business or operations or strategy, I found a mentor where I can learn from a little bit more of how they're leading that piece because I wanted to go in that direction. So I would just say, like, trying to align to a mentor. You just want to make sure you're really concise about what you want to get from that relationship. Um, because even though the mentor is going to um, grow by having another relationship with you, pretty much the mentor is doing you a favor, right? Like they are giving you a skill set, uh, experience and opportunity to learn from, um, and you're going to run with that. So in summary, very big difference between advocate and sponsor and mentor. And a mentor, you should learn something, experience a skill set, perspective, someone to help you think through an expert expert item. Um, be really strategic about how you pick that person. And the last thing I would add to the few mentors I have had in in my company is um, it's great when you have a formal mentorship program, right? Because that does um, it eliminates the awkward connection. Um, but many times is I've had a mentor because I've proved, I've worked with them or I've proven myself or I've earned my right to have them be my mentor, <laughs> right? You know, like, especially people at very senior levels, they're very busy. And so they don't, they don't say yes to that a lot unless it's a program. Um, so if, unless it's a program, it's, it's someone who I've worked with. Um, and I made that connection there. Awesome. Thank you for that. I have a lot of advocates. Yes. I never have too many advocates and sponsors, right? Absolutely. Guys, I know we've got about a um, little less than 10 minutes or so left. Any final questions or key takeaways from Jennifer's um, conversation with us? Can I ask one more question, Lee Wallace, which is um, yeah. because I know that uh, I know this about you, Jennifer, that you have a strong faith. So I know that means different things to different people. Um, and and on this call, that I'm sure means a lot of different things to a different to different people. I know that you your faith guides you in your life in a lot of ways. I'm curious. Um, can you speak to how your faith has guided you in business? Yes. Um, so it, it is an interesting topic, right? Because um, how I think about my faith is it, is it is part of me, it's who I am, and I'm a genuine person with all levels that I interact with. Um, how it has guided me in my career and in business is that um, I don't stress out about what my next role is or position is or anything like that, because for me, I kind of you know, let my faith guide that, right? And I know that I don't have a ton of control. I work really hard, and but I also don't stress out about it. So I think that's a big piece of how how faith interacts in my career and um, in my business goals is it all tends to just work out, 
<laughs> and I'm not saying that in a flippant way. I do the work and I prepare myself and I know where I'm going, but I also don't stress out about things that I can't control. You know, when I started at Wells Fargo, I started uh, with Wachovia. If you remember in 2008, we were like Citibank for two days. And then we were something else. Someone else bought us for a day. And then, I, and then we became Wells Fargo and there were mergers and mergers and acquisition, all that stuff. And I could have like, I could have stressed myself out so much about what's going to happen or I need to position myself here. And, and I was smart about it. Again, don't be naive, but at the same time, I didn't, I didn't stress out too much. The, the other thing on, on how it plays a really big part in my career and um, in, in, in business is um, I really tried to be genuine and appropriately vulnerable, right? Um, because at the end of the day, I think we're all here on earth to leave a positive footprint and to make others um, feel better. And so uh, there are some leaders that like are the yelling type or you know do all that stuff. And that's just not me. And that's how um, I think my faith has guided me a bit too, is just how I lead um, and, how, uh, and how I interact with others. Jennifer, I had a question and apologize if you went over this. I had to hop off the first 30 minutes to go get a sick child from school. So <laughs> I'm oh. back joining the conversation, but i um, curious to see like uh, what's on your reading list or on your in your podcast library or just any morning routines or things you do, you know, to get some personal and professional development. Yes, um, I love reading. Um, I don't have a lot of time for reading, so I have to get very creative. So I am also a very big planner. I joke, I have like five planners of all these different things. I have a checklist planner. I have all these stuff. So I am, I love spreadsheets. I love planning. I love reading. Um, but so what I do is I have a book, like a real book that's by, by my nightstand. And it's usually like a fun one, um, like a Nicholas Sparks or just some story that I don't, you know, total fiction story. Um, I have uh, audiobooks and podcasts and I rotate them because I like change, right? So um, the, the audiobooks that I've, um, I've when I'm starting to read, um, it's called the, the Atomic Habits. And it's really focused on, um, I'm trying to get routines in my morning, trying to get routines in my nighttime. And um, I have... Uh, my, my best friend who I check in on our routines, right? It was like, what time am I waking up? Am I going to the gym? Am I doing that? And so I'm focused on the healthy habits. Like I don't drink diet soda, which is really hard because Diet Coke is really good. Um, you know, so I'm like, I'm trying to focus on changing habits because those add up to big, to big shifts. So anything about, you know, habits or planning, um, I, I love reading, reading all of those, but I also make sure to get a fun fiction one here and there once in a while. Awesome, thank you. Well, Jennifer, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with all of us this afternoon. I know um, I've got several great takeaways and kind of nuggets that I'm walking away from, and I know the, the rest of the group will as well. Um, appreciate your extended family joining us for the conversation as well. I'm grateful that they were able to be here, and I know that everyone looks forward to staying connected with you now that you're part of our extended network. Um, thank you, Lydia, for the introduction, and hope everyone has a great rest of their afternoon. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.